So now, this is the third session. Let's complete Stokes law so that we can move on to surface tension. First of all, Stokes law is a very simple law. If we have a particle of radius r moving with a speed v with respect to a fluid of viscosity nita, then a force of drag acts on the particle in direction opposite to its velocity. The force of drag comes out to be equal to 6 pi nita rv. 6 is a constant, pi is a constant, nita is the viscosity of fluid, r is the radius of this particle and v is the speed with which this particle moves. Now let's do next heading terminal velocity. Let's say a drop of water gets created in the air. As soon as the drop of water gets created, it has got no velocity. Since the drop of water has got no velocity, no drag force will act on it. But initially, as soon as the drop of water gets created, there are two forces acting on it. One, the force of gravity because of its weight. The force of gravity has to be nothing but mass of the drop into g. Mass of the drop can be written as density of the drop into volume of drop. Density of let's say this drop material is rho and the volume is 4 by 3 pi r cube into g. As well as the surrounding air will apply a buoyant force upward. This buoyant force upward has to be equal to density of surrounding fluid which we have taken as sigma into the volume summer since the entire drop is inside this fluid we have taken it again as 4 by 3 pi r cube into g. Now initially if the weight of the drop is more than more than the density of surrounding fluid or the buoyant force the drop starts moving down. As the drop starts moving down, its speed in downward direction increases. As the speed in downward direction increases, the drag force in upward direction keeps on increasing till the point where the net force on the drop becomes zero. When the net force on the drop becomes zero, we say that the net acceleration of the drop is zero. And when the acceleration becomes zero, the drop is said to have attained a terminal velocity. So if the drop attains a terminal velocity V, whenever the drop attains it, the net force on the drop becomes zero. If it attains a terminal velocity v, at that instant three forces will be acting on it. The force of gravity downwards, the force of buoyancy upward as well as the force of drag upward. The force of gravity downward will be rho into 4 by 3 pi r cube into g. The force of buoyancy upward will be will be sigma density of surrounding fluid into 4 by 3 pi r cube into g as well as the drag force upward has to be 6 pi nita rv. If the drop has attained terminal velocity then the net force has to be zero. So the force of gravity has to be equal to force of buoyancy plus the force of drag. We have written it here. Now, force of gravity, rho into 4 by 3 pi r cube into g, force of buoyancy, sigma into 4 by 3 pi r cube into g, and the force of drag, 6 pi nita rv. If you bring this term, the force of buoyancy on left hand side, 4 by 3 pi r cube into g can be taken as common, so you are left with rho minus sigma. Now, here you can cancel out 1 pi with 1 pi, 1 r with this, you get an r square. So, the terminal velocity comes out to be, and here you have 6, here you have got 4, so make it 2, make it 3. So, you get 2 by 9, sigma minus rho into r square into g upon the viscosity of fluid. If you look at the velocity profile, how the velocity changes with time, it comes out to be nothing but the first hour, first order growth curve. The same type of curve we find in charging of capacitors, the same type of curve we get in growth of current in an inductor. Now, notice that the terminal velocity is directly proportional to the whole square of radius. So if let's say two drops are created in atmosphere having radius ratio 1 is to 2, if the ratio of radius of drop is 1 is to 2, then the ratio of their terminal velocity has to be 1 is to 4. If the ratio of radius is 1 is to 3, then the ratio of terminal velocity will be 1 is to 9 because terminal velocity is directly proportional to whole square of the radius of drop. One question, if two drops have mass in the ratio 1 is to 8, what is the ratio of their terminal velocity? Here they haven't given radius, they have, a, they have given mass. Now see kids, if the masses are in ratio 1 is to 8, then the volume of drops also have to be in ratio 1 is to 8. And we know that volume is proportional to radius whole cube. So if masses are in ratio 1 is to 8, volume is in ratio 1 is to 8. For volume to be in ratio 1 is to 8, ratio has to be in radius ratio 1 is to 2. If the radius is in ratio 1 is to 2, then you will say the terminal velocity of 1 upon the terminal velocity of 2, the ratio of terminal velocity has to be 1 is to 4. Masses are in ratio 1 is to 8, volume has to be in ratio 1 is to 8. For this to happen, the radius has to be in ratio 1 is to 2. If the radiuses are in ratio 1 is to 2, the terminal velocity has to be in ratio 1 is to 4. Next question. When a drop falls with terminal velocity, the rate of loss of energy is proportional to r raised to power of n. What is n? This is previous to previous year. Neat question. Now, let's say the drop has a mass m and it goes, what, goes down with a velocity equals to terminal velocity. In a time dt, it will fall by distance v dt. So the loss in potential energy, infinitely small loss in potential energy has to be mgv dt. 
so you get the rate of loss of energy du by dt equals to mgv the mass of the drop is proportional to r cube okay because the volume is proportional to r cube and the terminal velocity is proportional to r square so the rate of loss of energy with respect to time comes out to be proportional to r cube into r square that comes out to be proportional to r raised to the power of 5 so let's start with surface tension first of all we need to learn two terminology cohesive forces and adhesive forces the force acting between same type of molecule is called cohesive force while adhesive force is the force acting between different type of molecule the first time you have heard the word adhesive and like it was in the ad of favicol favicol is an adhesive favicol sticks with wood both are different type of molecules the force acting between different type of molecules is called adhesive force and the force acting between same type of molecules is called cohesive force now let's think of a liquid in a container a liquid is a liquid because its molecule attract each other a very famous question why is h2o liquid and h2s gas h2o is liquid because of the presence of hydrogen bonding a liquid can only be liquid when there is intramolecular force of attraction between the molecules so two water molecules attract each other in the similar way all liquid molecules attract each other and when we talk about the force between same type of molecules such a force is called cohesive force so let's say we have got this container with fluid inside it now how many molecules there will be infinity means not infinity technically but huge number of molecules let's think of one molecule and in the bulk of liquid if you think of one molecule in the bulk of liquid all the molecules in the surrounding will be attracting it so there will be force in all direction i'm bound to draw in 2d but i always tell students to visualize in 3d so if you have got one molecule in bulk all the molecules in the surrounding will pull it towards themselves in 3d what will be the net force on one molecule in bulk so the net cohesive force the net cohesive force on one molecule in bulk will be zero because force is a vector quantity they act in all direction and they add up to zero what is the net cohesive force on one molecule on the surface then think 3d there is one molecule on surface all the molecules below it will attract it what will be the direction of net cohesive force in this case the net cohesive force won't be zero because there are not molecules present upward so net cohesive force the net cohesive force on one molecule on surface rather than saying downwards i will say is towards the bulk it's towards the bulk because tomorrow you might have a drop of water in space if you have got a drop of water in space even here one molecule on the surface will be attracted by all the other water molecule and the net force will come out to be towards the bulk so what i'm trying to explain from here the net cohesive force on a molecule in the bulk is zero and the net cohesive force on a molecule on the surface is towards the bulk think that somehow we increase the surface area of this container if the surface area of container increases then the number of molecules on the surface should also increase if a molecule moves from bulk to the surface as it approaches nearby surface a net cohesive force starts acting on it in downward direction if a molecule moves from bulk to the surface while moving from bulk to the surface nearby surface the force act towards the bulk so if a molecule moves from bulk to surface what is the sign of the work done by cohesive force on this molecule the force is towards the bulk but if this molecule goes from bulk to surface the displacement is away from bulk if the force and displacement are anti parallel then the sign of the work done is negative so as a molecule moves from bulk to the surface the work done on that molecule is negative now let's talk about change in potential energy we define the change in potential energy equals to minus times the work done by conservative force if the work done by conservative force is negative we change that we say that the change in potential energy is positive and if the work done by conservative force is positive we say that the change in potential energy is negative if a molecule moves from bulk to the surface the work done by cohesive force is negative if the work done by cohesive force is negative this means that the change in potential energy is positive if more and more molecule move from bulk to the surface 
let's say we have got this pan whose side walls we can increase if we can if we can move the side walls away the surface area will increase for increment of surface area more and more molecules will have to move from bulk to the surface as more and more molecule moves from bulk to the surface the work done by cohesive force on the molecules will be negative so the change in potential energy has to be positive so as more and more molecule move to the surface more is the surface potential energy the surface potential energy is directly proportional to the number of molecules that are present on the surface and the number of molecules that are present on the surface is directly proportional to the surface area then we add up a proportionality constant we say that the surface potential energy equals to something times surface area and this something is called surface tension so now let's discuss the force of surface tension let's say you have a container filled with a fluid we already have learned that the net cohesive force on a molecule on the surface is towards the bulk this is the side view of the container containing the fluid but let's say we are looking at it from top so what will the top view look like so the top view will look like a circle with a fluid now think of one molecule of the fluid on its surface and think of the forces being applied by other surface molecule so you have got this surface if you think of one water molecule or liquid molecule on its surface all the other molecules present on surface will pull it towards themselves what will be the net cohesive force along the surface since all the force all the particle pull in all direction on surface the net cohesive force along the surface will be zero now rather than thinking thinking of a single molecule think of a line of molecules so if you think of a line of molecules this line of molecules divide the surface into two parts part 1 and part 2 now think what is the direction of force applied by one side of the surface let's say by part 2 not by part 1 so the molecules present in part 2 will pull this molecules towards itself what will be the direction of this net force applied by part 2 so on this single molecule all the the resultant of all these forces applied by all the other surface molecule present in part 2 will be somewhere here similarly on second molecule also here third molecule fourth molecule fifth molecule sixth molecule second molecule if i ask if on a single molecule the force is f and let's say here we have got 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 seven molecules then what will be the force combinedly on this seven molecule so if on a single molecule the force is f then on seven molecules the force has to be 7f if i combinedly talk of all the molecules and combinedly talk of the force acting on all the molecules cues what will be the direction of force and what will be its magnitude first of all i can say if i have got some number of molecules then the force applied by one side of surface on this line of molecules is directly proportional to number of molecules the greater the number of molecules the greater is the force second thing the force also has to be directly proportional to length because the more more the number of molecules you take the more the length of the imaginary line on this surface you take so the force has to be directly proportional to length if force is directly proportional to length physicists always like to add up the proportionality constant and this proportionality constant is also called surface tension this also comes out to be the same thing t one important thing you should know about the force of surface tension the force of surface tension acts perpendicular to the imaginary length and always along the surface now we need to, to discuss one important thing which is the common error that students do understanding the meaning of a film not the movie film now let's say you have a soap solution and you have got this small circular frame you dip the small circular frame in the soap solution take it out and then blow the bubble we all have done this in childhood when we take this small frame out of the soap a film of soap gets formed here what i am trying to teach about this film if we look on this frame from the side what will the film look like so there will be air here then there will be a thin soap film and then there will be again air a film has got two surfaces one air soap it uh, surface here and another soap air surface here so remember this important line that a film has got two surfaces so two example first there is this rectangular frame with one side movable on this rectangular frame 
we have got a so film of surface tension t and the length of this movable side is l question is determine the mass to be placed on the pan so as to keep it in equilibrium so that this movable side do not move down do not move up now we know that the force of surface tension is t into l and the force of surface tension acts along the surface perpendicular to length what will be the force of surface tension on this movable side if you say tl you are wrong because a film has got two surfaces so because of the front surface there will be a force tl upwards as well as because of the back surface on this movable part there will be a force tl upward so as to keep keep it in equilibrium let's say we have to place a mass m here for the rod to be in equilibrium the upward force should be equal to downward force so the upward force 2tl must be balanced by mg so the mass that has to be placed is 2tl by g the only purpose of taking up this question is to explain that a film has got two surfaces always keep this in mind next question there is again a rectangular frame with three side fakes with a so film of surface tension t and one side movable this movable side has a length l if the movable side is moved by distance x let's say find the change in surface potential energy solution we know that the surface potential energy is surface tension times surface area now the change in surface potential energy equals to surface times surface tension times the change in surface area when this movable side move by distance x what will be the change in surface area the extra surface area created will be equal to l into x so you will say the change in surface potential energy equals to t into the change in surface area l into x this is wrong answer why again keep in mind a film has got two surface so when the the rod moves by distance x in front you get an extra surface area lx on the back side you get an extra surface area lx so the change in potential energy surface potential energy should be written as t times 2 lx next example a drop of radius r is made up of fluid of surface tension t is split into n identical smaller drop find the increase in surface potential energy when one brick drop is split into many small drops the surface area increases since the surface area increases the surface potential energy increases so in this question we have to find that thing so solution let's say you have got one single big drop of radius r and this drop breaks down into n identical small drops of let's say each of radius is small r using volume conservation you can say the volume of this bigger sphere is 4 by 3 pi r cube this volume has to be equal to the combined volume of all these small drops the number of drops you have is n and the volume of each drop will be 4 by 3 pi small r cube so you can write this equals to n into 4 by 3 pi small r cube you can cancel out 4 by 3 4 by 3 pi so you get the radius of a smaller drop equals to radius of capital drop upon n raised to power of 1 by 3 now we need to find the increase in surface potential energy the initial surface potential energy will be equal to surface tension times initial surface area that is 4 pi r square the final surface potential energy equals to the surface potential energy of one drop multiplied by number of drop one drop let's say has got radius small r so the surface area of one drop will be 4 pi small r square the surface potential energy of one drop will be the surface area of one drop multiplied by surface tension but since you have got n number of drop the final surface potential energy becomes n times this now what is the change in surface potential energy final minus initial so you get n t 4 pi r square minus t 4 pi capital r square here kids you can take t into 4 pi as common so you get n r square minus radius of the bigger drop whole square in place of this small r you can write capital r upon n raised to the power of 1 by 3 so you get 4 pi t into capital r square and there is an n here upon n raised to the power of 1 by 3 whole square that becomes n raised to the power of 2 by 3 minus r square so here you can take even r square common so you get 4 pi t into r square multiplied by n upon n raised to the power of 2 by 3 becomes n raised to the power of 1 by 3 minus 1 this will be the gain in surface potential energy next example a bubble of radius r made up of so film of surface tension t if the radius of bubble is double find the change in surface potential energy solution let's say this bubble has got initial radius r how will you write the initial surface potential energy 
the initial surface potential energy will be written as surface tension times surface area the surface area of this bubble will be 4 pi r square this is the initial surface potential energy if you do this this is wrong why what is a bubble bubble has got air outside as well as air inside so a bubble is nothing but a curved film a bubble always have got two surface one is outer surface one is inner surface so we should write the initial surface potential energy as surface tension into the surface area outer surface as well as inner surface since the thickness is not at all appreciable we can take the outer surface area equals to in inner surface area so the total surface area become 2 times 4 pi r square now when the radius becomes double the final surface potential energy becomes surface tension into the final surface area again 2 surface area the radius is 2r so the outer surface area will be 4 pi 2r square as well as the inner will be 4 pi 2r square so get 2 into 4 pi 2r whole square now what is the change in surface potential energy final minus initial that will be the change in surface potential energy so now excess pressure just look at this balloon and can you tell where the pressure is more inside or outside your guess is right the pressure inside balloon is more than the pressure outside how can you say two simple methods first if we open up the balloon the air moves from inside to outside since the air moves from inside to outside the pressure inside has to be more than pressure outside but there is one more beautiful way to express where the pressure is more that is by looking at the curvature of the surface let's say you have got subsurface straight and if the force x from this side how will the surface bend this way if the force acts from that side how will the surface bend this way now if the force acting on this side is more then the surface bends out this way if the force acting from this side is more then the surface bends out this way so just by looking at curvature of a surface we can tell on which side the pressure is more for example if we look at the surface of bubble anywhere let's say here and we think of this point as one and this point is two as the surface is curved out we can say that the pressure at one is more than the pressure at two similarly if here we have got point x and y and let's say this is some surface this surface i don't care where the pressure is more at x or at y just by looking at surface we know that the force from top has to be more than only the surface will bend out this way so the pressure at x has to be more than pressure at y similarly if let's say you find this type of surface somewhere where the pressure is more at a or at b if you see a membrane with this shape then the force from this side has to be more that's why the membrane would have bent then the pressure at b has to be more than the pressure at a now if you have a drop made up of uh, made up of material of surface tension t having radius r then the pressure inside the drop is more than the pressure outside how do you know just by looking at surface since the pressure inside is more than pressure outside by how much it is more the excess pressure or the difference in pressure between inside and outside is 2 t by r now first question if you have got two drops in space one of smaller radius one of larger radius inside which drop the pressure will be more the drop which will have lower radius the excess pressure inside that drop has to be higher and the drop which has got higher radius the excess pressure inside that drop will be lower across a bubble a bubble has got two surfaces rather than one so the excess pressure in the case of a bubble comes out to be double the excess pressure than in the case of a drop so in case of drop the excess pressure is 2t by r and in case of bubble the excess pressure is 4t by r exactly double remember that what we call a bubble of air in water that is not at all bubble of air in water that is actually a drop of air in water a bubble is called called a bubble when it is made up of a curved film if you have got a bubble of air in water what we say in our normal language inside you have got air outside you have got only water there are not two surfaces there is only one surface so a bubble of air in water is actually a drop of air in water remember that okay moving on a simple example let's say you have got this tube and n at the two ends of tube you have got two bubbles one of smaller radius one of larger radius you open up now what will happen tell me if the 
प्रेशर इन साइड बिगर बबल इज पी वन एंड प्रेशर इन साइड स्मॉलर बबल इज पी टू विच प्रेशर विल बी हायर पी टू विल बी मोर देन पी वन सो इफ यू ओपन अप दिस नॉब अवर कॉमन सेंस टेल्स अस दैट दिस बिगर बबल विल विल बिकम स्मॉल एंड स्मॉलर वन विल बिकम बिगर दैट डज नॉट हैपन एट ऑल actually the smaller bubble becomes even smaller and the bigger bubble becomes even bigger as you are medical student you must have learned there is a coating of surfactant inside lungs so that our alveoles can expand that is because of the same effect surfactants reduce the surface tension next thing if two bubbles of radius r1 and r2 coalesce in vacuum to form a bigger bubble what will be the radius of this bigger bubble so let's say we have got two bubbles of radius r1 and r2 in vacuum and they coalesce to form a bigger bubble of radius r dash if the number of moles in this first bubble is n1 number of moles in this second bubble is n2 then the number of moles in this bigger bubble has to be n1 plus n2 we know that pv equals to nrt so the number of moles can be written as pv by rt now you can say the pressure of air inside this first bubble has to be equal to 4t by r1 why because outside is vacuum so the excess pressure will be equal to pressure inside the volume of this first bubble will be 4 by 3 pi r1 cube upon rt plus the number of moles in second bubble that will be 4t by r2 the pressure in the second bubble into 4 by 3 pi R two Q by R T. This has to be equal to the number of bubbles here. Sorry, the number number of moles moles of gas in this bubble. The pressure inside this bubble, if it has a radius R dash, will be forty by R dash. The volume of this bubble will be four by three pi R dash Q upon R T. You can see it's R T R T R T forty forty forty. 4 pi by 3, 4 pi by 3, 4 pi by 3 get cancelled. Even one term of R1 here you get R1 square, here you get R2 square, here you get R2 square. So the final equation comes out to be R1 square plus R2 square equals to R dash square. So the radius of this bubble formed is nothing but under root of R1 square plus R2 square. If they say that two bubbles of radius 3 centimeter and 4 centimeter coalesce in vacuum under isothermal condition. then what is the final radius of bigger bubble form that is under root of 3 square plus 4 square that is 5 many a times while taking a bath you might have seen double bubble double bubble means a smaller bubble growing over a bigger bubble so let's say we have got this double bubble the radius of bigger part of bubble is r1 the radius of smaller part of bubble is r2 here multiple type of questions are asked first thing first how will the interface between the two bubbles will look like option 1 option 2 option 3 now since we know that the pressure inside the smaller bubble has to be larger what has to be the shape of this interface since here the pressure is larger larger the shape of this interface has to be like option 2 so let's say this interface looks something like this and let's say this interface has some radius r dash they might ask what is the value of r dash how to find it it's quite simple you can say let's say the external pressure is patm so pressure inside the bigger bubble will be patm plus 4t by r1 the pressure inside this is smaller bubble of radius r2 will be patm plus 4t by r2 across this surface the pressure difference is this one is more pressure is smaller bubble this one is lesser pressure so the pressure difference across this interface which has to be equal to 4t by r dash has to be nothing but the pressure inside smaller bubble minus the pressure inside bigger bubble that is patm plus 4t by r2 minus patm plus 4t by r PATM PATM get cancelled, so you get 4T by R dash equals to 4T by R2 minus 4T by R1. We can cancel out 40, 40, 40. So we get 1 by R dash equals to 1 by R2 minus 1 by R1. So from here you get 1 by R dash equals to R1 minus R2 
by R1, R2 or R dash equals to R1, R2 by R1 minus R2. One more question that get asked and which is gaining popularity day in day out. At the point of contact, what is this angle theta? If you look at this point at which the three surfaces meet, if the, if the surface tension is T and we think of a small length L, this way the force will be 2Tn, this way the force will be 2Tn as well as this way the force will be 2Tn. If three equal forces have to be balanced, then the angle between the forces have to be 120 degree. So wherever you see this double bubble, this angle theta comes out to be 120 degree. Now let's talk about the heading called angle of contact. Angle of contact is defined as the angle made by fluid surface with the solid surface inside the fluid. For glass and water, we find this type of meniscus. The angle of contact is the angle made by fluid surface with the solid surface inside the fluid. For glass and water, the angle of contact comes out to be acute. Similarly, for mercury and glass, the surface comes out to be something like this. The angle of contact is the angle made by fluid surface with the solid surface inside the fluid. So for mercury glass, the angle of contact is obtuse. Now, the big question is why in some cases the angle of contact is acute and why in some cases the angle of contact is obtuse. Remember that in the chapter of fluids, we always say the surface is flat. Why? Because the force of gravity pulls it down. So what? The surface is formed perpendicular to the net force. The surface is formed perpendicular to the net force. Now here, if we think of cohesive forces as well as adhesive forces, think of some molecules present at the end. Because of all the molecules present in the near vicinity, there will be cohesive force in their direction. What will be the direction of net cohesive force? The net cohesive force will come out to be somewhere here exactly midway this will be the net cohesive force between this liquid and the container molecules there will be adhesive force because we are at the end of the wall now this container molecules will always will also attract this liquid molecule towards itself so this molecule of container will attract it towards 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 everywhere so if we think of what will be the direction of net adhesive force so so for some molecule present here cohesive force acts everywhere in this direction you get net cohesive force and in this direction you get net adhesive force and there is a small force of gravity down here how will the surface be formed depends upon the resultant of these three force for example in case of mercury and glass the cohesive force is very large there is some adhesive force as well as some force of gravity. When we resolve these three forces, the net force comes out to be somewhere here. If the net force comes out to be somewhere here, in case of mercury, because the cohesive force is very large, the surface has to be formed perpendicular to this net force, perpendicular to this net force, like something like this. That's why the surface of mercury has got an obtuse angle of contact. In case of water and glass, the cohesive force is substantial because of hydrogen bonding, but the adhesive force is very large and then there is a force of gravity. Now since the adhesive force is large, the net contact force, the net force on this molecule comes out to be somewhere here. Since the net force on this molecule comes out to be somewhere here, the surface has to be formed perpendicular to it. That's why the surface looks something like this and the angle of contact for water glass comes out to be acute. The things worth noticing here is this. <clears throat> if the angle of contact is obtuse, then the fluid do not wet the surface. If you put water drops on raincoat, it do not wet the surface. They simply slide over the surface. If you put mercury on, on a table, it simply uh, remains as a drop and it do not wet the surface. So if the angle of contact is obtuse, the liquid do not wet the surface. And if the angle of con contact is acute, then the liquid wets the surface. So now let's wind up this session on fluid by learning the capillary action. When we immerse 
a glass tube into water, the, wo the water rises into it. But why? The answer lies here. Let's say you immerse glass tube into water. We know that for water and glass, the angle of contact is acute. Since the angle of contact is acute, this type of water surface, surface is formed inside glass. Now think of two points just above this surface and just below this surface. At which point the pressure has to be higher, one or two. If the shape is this, then upper pressure has to be more than lower pressure. The pressure at point one, which is exposed to atmosphere is P at and the pressure at point two has to be less. So the pressure at point two is less than P at while the pressure at point one equals to P at Now think of two points outside three and four. 3 is in air, its pressure will be equal to P atm, while 4 at the same level as 2 will have pressure slightly more than P atm. So understand that at 2 the pressure is less than P atm, but at 4 which is at the same level the pressure is little more than P atm. So what happens is that fluid starts to move from outside inwards and it keeps on moving inward till the time the pressure of this point becomes equals to P atm. Now how to find the height of fluid inside the capillary tube? Very simple equation. Let's say here the curvature of this meniscus is R. Curvature of meniscus and radius of tube are two different things. If the curvature of this meniscus is R and let's say at this point pressure is P atm, then just below a single surface just like drop, the pressure difference created by this meniscus will be 2T by radius of curvature. So pressure at top is P atm, the pressure just below has to be 2T by R, R is the radius of meniscus. So you write P atm minus 2T by R plus rho GH has to be equal to P atm because the fluid will keep on entering inside till the pressure at point 2 do not become equal to P atm. So we can write equation P atm minus 2T by R plus rho GH equals to P atm. But we need to find the formula in terms of radius of this tube. For that we need to find correlation between this radius of meniscus and radius of tube. So think of this whole meniscus and let's say this meniscus has a radius r and the tube has got radius smaller. This angle of contact is theta. Draw one horizontal line here. The radius and this tangent has to be perpendicular. If this angle is theta, this angle is 90 minus theta. So this angle right here has to be theta. Look into this right angle triangle radius r radius of tube is small r and this angle theta. You can say r cos theta equals to radius of tube or radius of meniscus equals to radius of tube by cos theta. So we will write equation P atm minus 2t by radius of meniscus plus rho gh equals to P atm. P atm, P atm gets cancelled. So you get 2t by radius of meniscus equals to rho gh. In place of radius of meniscus, you can write radius of tube divided by cos theta. When you substitute that, you get 2t in place of r, right? Radius of tube divided by cos theta, the cos theta goes up equals to rho gh. So the height of the fluid in the capillary comes out to be 2t cos theta by rho rg. Notice that the height of the fluid rise in the capillary is inversely proportional to the radius of the tube. This particular law is called Zurin's law. The lesser the radius of tube, the more the fluid will rise inside that tube. Now there are multiple cases asked. If this capillary, capillary is taken into lift and the lift goes up with an acceleration A. If the lift goes up with an acceleration A in place of G, write G plus A. If the lift goes down with an acceleration A in place of G, write G minus A. If the lift free fall, then the G effective becomes zero. If the G effective becomes zero, this type of questions are asked. If a capillary tube system is taken into space, what will be the height of fluid rise? In space, the G effective becomes zero. If the G effective becomes zero, you shouldn't give the answer as infinity. What you should give the answer, answer, sir, is that the fluid will rise till the top and will occupy the entire capillary. So if the G effective becomes zero, the height to which the fluid rise inside the capillary equals to the length of entire capillary. Next thing. If the capillary is of insufficient length, let's say the water can rise up to height of 25 centimeter, but I have got capillary tube only of length 13 centimeter, then what happens? Do the water starts to come out? No. Water reaches till the top and then after reaching the top, the angle of contact increases. 
So if the capillary tube is of insufficient length, the fluid reaches till the top and then the angle of contact increases. This is what happens. Next thing, if you have got capillary tube, whether kept vertical or whether kept at some angle, in both the cases, the fluid rises to the same height. Definitely, in the slant capillary, the length of the fluid will be more. But the fluid will rise to the same height in both the capillaries. Thank you.